Hello and welcome back to Bookish and welcome back to my Saturday HodgePodge, my weekly wrap-up of bookish things, reading, booktube, anything else I happen to want to talk about. I wanted to start off today with some uh, channel recommendations for you, some new, uh, some old, as you may know, because I've said it on my channel before, uh, I watch a lot of YouTube and not all of it is booktube related. Sometimes I go down rabbit holes, I get fascinated with things, uh, for instance, I've talked here about my fascination with uh, narrowboat channels on the English Canal system, uh, which is ongoing and recommended a few channels there. I also once talked about channels where people just film themselves walking around beaches or uh, big cities in foreign countries, and I like those, but I, I kind of eventually got to where I realized there was a kind of a creep factor to those. <laughs> so they made me uncomfortable, I stopped watching them, but I still really kind of like that. Uh, like that idea and so I found a new channel uh, that uh, does completely non-creepy walk around videos um, I believe that this uh, channel creator is located in England uh, they have several videos where they walk around Bath which is a place uh, where I've been and that channel is called Everywhere is Imagined I'll leave a link to that channel uh, down below don't have a whole lot of videos like I want to say 20 maybe 20 to 30 videos but uh, really good uh, completely non-creepy walking around uh, city videos. If you don't know what I mean by walking around videos being creepy, if you just like, you know, in YouTube search engine typed in, you know, walk around London or walk around Paris, you'll see... <coughs> Go on. No. No. You don't, even, you don't even know what you're barking at. You don't. You don't. Hush. Go on. Go on. You'll see what I'm talking about. If you don't want to do that, you can just take my word for it. There is none of that on this channel. None of that on Everywhere is Imagined's channel. Ike, go on, please. Ike. Can't hear me anymore. Anyway, so there's that channel. Sorry for the dog interruption. I may or may not cut that out. Uh, there's also a new reading channel I've been following for a little while, and that channel is called Rachel is Reading. Uh, Rachel is a a young person who reads uh, the kind of books that I like to read, that I like to hear about. <coughs> Incredibly earnest reviews and discussions of those books. And for the most part, you know, it's just Rachel talking about books, which is one of those things I really like. I'll leave a link to that channel down below as well. Uh, and then the last thing I want to do is recommend that you go check out a channel that I've recommended many times before, somebody who I consider to be a friend I've made through BookTube, and that's Amy from the channel Amy Gets Lit. Uh, she does a, a series, of, or she did a series of uh, videos uh, examining Blood Meridian called, you know, What the F Did I Just Read? Uh, and she's doing uh, uh, Kafka on the Shore right now by Haruki Murakami. Uh, please go check those out. If you like Murakami and you, and you like that book, or you're curious or interested in that, go check out her video. She, she just does a great, great job. And uh, even though I'm not particularly myself a Murakami fan, uh, you know, occasionally I go watch these videos just to see, hear Amy talk about uh, books and to watch how creative her videos are. So please go check that out as well. Uh, this is Women in Translation Month, and I did read a book uh, by a woman in translation uh, for this month, and that book was Convenience Store Woman, which I, I think I mentioned was going to be my Women in Translation Month read. Um, and I did read it. It's a short kind of novella length book uh, and I liked it. Um, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. You know, from hearing other people talk about it, um, I gained, got the impression that the book was primarily about a, a, a young woman character who probably fits somewhere on the autism spectrum and her kind of happiness and work in convenience store and the determination of her family uh, to kind of get her to move on and do something else with her life. And so what I imagined going into the book was that it was a book focused on uh, this kind of struggle uh, of an autistic person to find their place or a person on the autism spectrum to find a place of comfort, you know, function, happiness, uh, and particularly uh, amidst pressure from their family. And there are those elements of the book, but one of the things that, that surprised me in the book is that it really seems to me to be a commentary about uh, Japanese society and how Japanese society looks at and evaluates and pressures women to follow uh, a certain path. Uh, I talked to Kazen from the channel uh, Always Doing 
uh, who lives and works in Japan and has, I think, for about a decade. Uh, and she was kind enough to, to reach out to me, and we exchanged some Voxer messages about this. And, you know, based on that discussion and, and, and what I read is, to me, it seems like the book is really uh, about this woman who may, in fact, be on the autism spectrum and looking at society strictly as a way to how to survive, how to get along uh, in a society that oftentimes doesn't seem to understand her. But really what it is then, I think, is this indictment, uh, and that may be too strong a word, but an indictment of the limits that Japanese society, limits and expectations that Japanese society puts on women. Now, that's not a topic I know a lot about, uh, but that's the impression I got from the book. And to me, that made the book really uh, add an extra layer of significance uh, to the book. And, and I enjoyed it. Like I said, it was a fast read. It didn't take me very long uh, to get through with the book. Uh, and it was enjoyable. Um, so I read that. Also, I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that I was buddy reading Freshwater by Kweke Meze uh, with um, Erica from the channel and the blog, The Broken Spine. We did finish that up at the beginning of, uh, of August, so that would be last week, and I forgot to talk about it um, on my last Saturday hodgepodge, so I thought I would give my impressions and some thoughts about uh, freshwater. So, according to uh, interviews and things I've read uh, from Amezi uh, since the publication of Freshwater, uh, they look at that book, or they say that book is largely autobiographical, but I read the book, and I thought the book was, was moving and effective in creating or recreating the idea of what it's like to be uh, inside the head or to be a person who, uh, from Amezi's point of view, is uh, tortured by demons or, you know, we might look at it in a more uh, Western way to suggest that uh, a person who has, what is it, disassociative personality disorder or multiple personalities uh, and the struggle uh, that they have to you know, avoid self-destruction and to, you know, be at peace with themselves and find a way uh, to live their lives uh, and to move forward. Uh, and in that respect, I think it works really well. The images that Ameze uh, makes or creates of kind of this uh, mental torture and all the things... <laughs> Zelda, 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 Ike. There's really nothing out there this time. Uh, literally, I think a leaf fell off a tree, or oh no, there's a squirrel in the tree. Now I see it. Uh, so you know we we have to interrupt Dad's video for a squirrel. Um, what was I saying? The the images and the. Uh, the story that Amenze creates about uh, this kind of nightmare scenario when she finds herself, and I won't give too much away about why or you know how this kind of self-destruction plays itself out, but is really powerful and really effective. That said, I, I don't, I didn't think the the book itself was particularly well constructed. It felt like the ending, the resolution, as it was, was somewhat rushed. I guess I would count it as one of those books which works uh, to make you feel things, works to put you inside the, the head, the mind of a character, but I think there are certain things about it as a work of fiction, uh, narrative construction, character development, um, even some, you know, some what I think are some kind of interesting, perhaps daring writing choices and sentence constructions and things like that, uh, that I didn't think worked. But on the whole, I think the book was a really effective uh, look into the mind and experience of someone who has uh, suffered uh, because of inner demons or uh, disassociative personality disorder. And that level, I think it was really effective. So I finished those books up earlier. I finished Convenience Store Woman, I think, near the beginning of the week. And then I kind of went into a mini slump. As you know, uh, we're still uh, reading Sanctuary uh, by William Faulkner for Faulkner in August. This is the end of week two, so I'll be making my Faulkner in August video uh, over chapters. I think it's chapters, I want to say it's 8 through 19. I'll be making the video over that and posting that uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and, you know, Sanctuary is not uh, a particularly pleasant book to read, whether you like Faulkner or not. 
uh, and perhaps reading Sanctuary right after reading uh, Freshwater uh, was is is having that effect on me. But um, but but it is an example, I think, of Faulkner essentially turning the cruelty in his novels and the the psychological abuse in his novels up to eleven uh, to use a Spinal Tap um, idea um, and and really kind of hammering those things home. But what I was getting at with that is that, that I've kind of been in a reading slump outside of Faulkner. I've been having a hard time getting started on the other books uh, that I've been reading, and that's no reflection on them, but I'm hoping to get into them uh, really heavily this weekend. As you're also probably aware, uh, the, one of the things that, uh, that I do in these videos is I indulge my own sense of nostalgia. I'm going to do that again today. Today is actually my 54th birthday. Uh, as you may know, I film these things on Friday. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready uh, to go to the eye doctor so I can treat myself to a new pair of glasses so maybe I can actually see uh, more clearly again. Uh, but in thinking about nostalgia, I, you know, since I grew up was a teenager primarily, well, I was a teenager in the 1980s. The 80s are what I think about, and I think about the incredibly awful, you know, stupid headstrong, hubris-filled person I was in the 1980s, and I shaved my head off at times. And part of what makes me do that the most is the music I listen to, so I thought I would torture you with a selection of eight of metal songs, heavy metal songs that I listened to in the 1980s. I was, you know, a heavy metal uh, listening teenage kid, uh, which wasn't all that uncommon in the 1980s, and I frequently drove around in my uh, cherry red uh, Camaro through the streets of the small town in which I lived uh, with my stereo uh, turned up really loud listening to metal songs. So I have a selection of uh, awful to not quite so bad metal songs <laughs> for you. Uh, the first I think is just truly awful, just to give you some idea of how bad my musical taste was, I think in the 1980s. Uh, sorry if that offends you, but I have a, a, I have a link to the song See You in Hell uh, by Grim Reaper. By the way, you'll probably also notice there's kind of a theme <laughs> to heavy metal songs from the 80s, or at least the ones that I listen to. Uh, also, one of my favorite songs to play really loud uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s was uh, Rainbow in the Dark by Ronnie James Dio. Uh, Ronnie James Dio, kind of a famous heavy metal singer. Uh, he replaced Ozzy Osbourne in uh, Black Sabbath for a while. He had a solo career. And Rainbow in the Dark is on was on his Holy Diver album. Uh, that's probably the song I irritated uh, my girlfriend, who then became my wife, with the most, and my friends in general. Uh, there weren't a lot of girls in 1980 who seemed to like Ronnie James Dio, at least not where I lived. Uh, and then I thought I would throw in a German, I believe they're a German metal band from the 80s called Accept, uh, and their song Balls to the Wall, and I'll leave that to uh, your imagination. Uh, but a very angry song. And then I thought I'd just go straight, terrify your mother, uh, uh, outrage the fundamentalist Christians in your town. Uh, and I, I, would, I included The Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden, uh, which is probably the song that, uh, you know, convinced more people that I was worshiping the devil than anything else. And then, you know, if that wasn't enough, I threw in two Black Sabbath songs because Black Sabbath, as the, you know, the actual probably creators of uh, real heavy metal music deserve uh, some shout outs here. So my favorite black, these are my two of my favorite Black Sabbath songs. The first is called War Pigs, which is like a heavy metal peace anthem <laughs> of sorts, uh, which I actually think is, is, uh, is one of uh, Black Sabbath's best songs. And then just to give you another uh, clue or insight into uh, me uh, as a teenager in the 80s, also then Black Sabbath's uh, song Sweet Leaf. Uh, I have links to all those songs down below. Uh, please enjoy, if you want to, if you dare, the embarrassing heavy metal music that I listened to in the 1980s. Okay, I think that's it uh, for this Saturday. Uh, I look forward to your comments in the comment section below, and as always, thank you for watching.